Welcome to the show discussing problems and issues of health with Dr. Alcena. For this segment of the show, I'm going to continue to talk about hypertension and of its major devastating if abnormal negative effect it has on the human body. When I left off last week, I was talking about congestive heart failure. I just less than a, an hour ago, I read an article uh, from uh, JAMA that states that um, between 2011 and 2017, the death rate from congestive heart failure in individual 65 years old and older in this country has increased by 38 percent. That's the death rate, increased by 38 percent. And we have altogether 5.7 million people there about who suffer congestive heart failure. And again, congestive heart failure can be caused, of course, by the heart having been damaged by a heart attack and it becomes too weak, then it can't pump properly. The heart has been, been damaged by the effect of, of high, high blood pressure. It becomes enlarged and it loses its pumping ability. It could fail that way. The heart can be, because if heart failure can occur because somebody has valvular heart disease, any one of the three valves that we have around our heart can be damaged that can ultimately cause congestive heart failure. The heart may be damaged by an infection, a viral infection, bacterial infection a fungal infection, HIV infection. Any one of these infections can damage the heart to the point where it cannot pump properly. And the heart, of course, can be damaged by other abnormalities as well, having nothing to do with high blood pressure or coronary heart disease or anything like that, that can cause the heart to actually fail and then can't pump because it causes heart failure. But at the center of chronic heart failure, which of course is high blood pressure. And cardiovascular disease itself, at the center of it, is hypertension. Across the world, 1.5 billion people suffer from hypertension. In this country, 1.3 million people suffer from hypertension. One out of every three American adults in this country suffer from hypertension. One out of every two Negro slash African-American individuals suffer from hypertension. Very serious problem. And, once the, and then the saddest thing about it, of all the three components of cardiovascular disease, namely high blood pressure, stroke, and coronary artery disease, what have you, the one that is the easiest to treat, the easiest to diagnose, and the easiest to treat is hypertension. And yet, we are in a crisis of poorly treated or untreated hypertension because if the people don't go to the doctor and a significant percentage of it is because of that, they just simply don't go. And when they do go, a lot of them don't follow the advice that the doctor give them as it relates to diet, which is very important. The diet is loaded with salt, loaded with fat, the American diet is. Of all the developed countries in the world, the United States has more obese individuals than any other developed countries. More than two-thirds of adults in this country are overweight slash obese. It's a, it's a crisis. And the bulk of it has to do with fast food. It has nothing to do with the fact that people may have hypothyroidism, a certain component of it do not have, and of course that can cause somebody to gain weight. The bulk of it has to do with lifestyle. Lifestyle having to do with stress, lifestyle having to do with poverty. I mean, look, look, look at what had happened yesterday. It came out on television last night. The top 1% in the individual in this country, the top 1% owns 70% of the wealth. Let me repeat that. The top 1% own 70% of the wealth in this country. And they're fighting every day to get more. And the rest are just struggling to survive, working two, three jobs to try to make ends meet. Under stress, they just simply don't have the time to sit down and eat a proper meal. They just grab what they can. 
you walk through the minority community, all over the place, you have fast food stores. These folks, many of whom don't have what it takes to go to a regular supermarket to buy food. They don't have a car, they can't pay for a cab to take them there, bring them back. So they eat the meal from what they could buy from these little stores. Many, many years ago, a study was done in New York City, whereby the gentleman that was a uh, public advocate, see, I remember the public advocate, did a study that showed that the vast majority of poor folks that live in these poor communities were buying food from those little stores, and they never had a chance to go to a regular supermarket to buy regular, healthy food. And then those stores themselves, according to the study, were buying leftover food from the big supermarket that every Thursday they bring new stuff. Every Wednesday those stuff has to be thrown away and they would just buy it and brought it to the little stores and sell them. I mean, the study was actually done by the public advocate of New York City, I remember that. This is not to criticize anybody, this is just to explain out the facts, all the different components. In addition to the genetic component that causes somebody to become hypertensive to begin with. All you have to do is be a Negro person and live long enough, you're going to become hypertensive. That's it. There's no if or but about it. This is the one disease you could guarantee to have as a person of color is live long enough, you're going to become hypertensive. By knowing that, you think you would do all that you can to take preventive measures. It's easier said than done. How can the individual take preventive measures when they don't even have time to sit and eat a regular meal when they're just grabbing whatever they can for breakfast, grabbing what they can for lunch, grabbing what they can for dinner because they have to run to the other job, they have the rent to pay, they have kids school to pay for, they have kids to take care of. I mean, it's, the vast majority of these people don't even have time to spend time with their own kids. Some of the kids take care of themselves, some of them after they leave school, there's nobody to even supervise them in many instances. And I'm not exaggerating, this is the truth. You have to look very hard to find a, a person that was as poor as I was when I was growing up. I had the similar experience. I know what poverty is firsthand. It's very unpleasant. To this day, I'm not able to sleep on my back. I have to sleep on my belly because when I was so hungry, the pain was so severe, to crush the pain of hunger, I learned how to sleep on my belly as a little boy with no mother, no father. How about that, okay? And people around me didn't like me because they thought I was arrogant because everything they asked me to do, I had the answers to everything. So because of that, they didn't like me. Every one of my siblings were taken over by other family members except me for doing nothing because I was a smart little boy. I wasn't fresh, I wasn't disobedient, I wasn't saying anything inappropriate, they just didn't like me, that's it. And as, it, as God would have it, who turned to, I'm the one who wind up taking care of all my siblings, those who survived. I'm the one who took care of all of them. I'm the one who brought most of them to this country and their children. You can't make this up, okay? So I know what poverty is. You eat what you can't afford, okay? So if one were to take a look at the Ascot study, anglo scandinavian studies, involving hundreds of thousands of individuals from, from England and Scandinavia, they evaluated the medications that were taken that is the most efficient to treat blood pressure. The only medications that make the big difference were the medication that has a Tazai water pill by itself or in combination with a calcium channel blocker or an, a, 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 um, an ab. All the other stuff did not work. Those were the only thing that decreased the incidence of heart attack, stroke, and heart disease, congestive heart failure, renal failure, all the rest of it. So that simple thing, knowing that you need to take a thiazide water pill as a first step and the treatment of hypertension is causing the bulk of the problem. You cannot have normal functioning kidneys and treat your blood pressure properly without taking a thiazide water pill. 
which happens to be the cheapest medication available to treat blood pressure. The thiazide water pill will take out the salt and then the water will follow. That will lower the intravascular system, concentrate it, and the pressure will come down. That's it. Now, if that's not sufficient, then you could add a second or a third medication depending on the ethnicity of the individual. But across the board, having nothing to do with that ethnicity, you must use a thiazide water pill. I know about the inconvenience that people have to run into the bathroom to you in it several times a day. You don't necessarily have to use one pill per day. Sometimes some of my patients have a pill three times a week. I have patients who use a thiazide, thiazide water pill twice a week. You have to cut and paste, cut and paste depending on the patient. But you have to have it. If you were to treat the blood pressure with anything other than a water pill, and you give enough of a large dose, the pressure comes down. As soon as the kidney senses that the pressure is dropping, the level of aldosterone is gonna go right up, right up, because the kidney think that it has to protect the body. One of the ways the kidney knows how to do it is to hold on to aldosterone, which then cause salt to be retained, hold on to water to protect the body. So if you treat blood pressure with a non thiazide type water pill, the kidney is gonna know and the kidney is going to hold on to salt, hold on to water to try to protect the body. How about that? So you don't have to do it every day. You could do it two, three times a week in conjunction with something else. The issue comes in, what is that something else is going to be? But you have to know enough physiology. You have to know about enough of the ethnicity of the individual to know which second medication is appropriate, which third medication is appropriate, and which are not. Nobody wants to talk about that because many of us are facing tremendous issues dealing with the racial discrimination every day in this country, every hour, every minute. And yet, when it comes to the reality of who you really are so that you can get treated properly, people think it is offensive to talk about people ethnicity as it relates to medicine. It is not. It is for the benefit of the, the, of the patient, not it's for the medical benefit of the patient because the physiology is different in different ethnic groups. And if you don't take that, and there is no disease that is more appropriate to use to explain that than hypertension because all of us human beings have a gene in our kidneys, G protein coupled receptor kinase type 4. Let me repeat that. All human beings as a gene that started out of Africa. That's correct. And the gene is G protein coupled receptor kinase type 4, which was discovered at Georgetown University and University of Virginia. And I, sitting on my table, had a house in Walkland. In those days, I was pushing hard to try to get promotion academically. I was writing articles like crazy. I came up with the idea that there had to have been a gene somewhere in the human body that allow our forebearers in Africa thousands and thousands of years ago to stay alive because of the ambient situation that existed there with the heat and lack of water. And I bet you there's a gene that had to be a salt retaining gene. Here, our kidney think we're still living in Africa. So therefore the kidney is trying to retain salt. We don't need the salt here, but they needed it in Africa. So sure, sure enough, this the universities pick up on that. They did the study. They found out all three ethnic groups, the Japanese American, Caucasian American, and black from Ghana. They had kidney specimens. They grind them up. They found the same gene in all three ethnic groups. Let me repeat the name of the gene. G protein coupled receptor kinase type four. It's in everybody's kidney. That's the gene that is really responsible for essential hypertension. And 97 of all hypertension is due to essential hypertension. How about that? People have every right to call themselves whatever they want to call themselves, to worship any god that they want. That's their right. I support that fully. But when you are a physician, I know how un uncomfortable it is. I was telling that to a student in the office. It is very uncomfortable for physicians with all that they have to deal with to have to explain to a patient, sir, you really need 
this medication because of X, Y, and Z. Oh boy. Whew. You mean to tell me I'm not Caucasian? Oh my God. Whew. But how are you going to tell me you're Caucasian when your skin is darker than mine? Give me a break. I accept the reality for what it is so that doctors can treat you properly so that you can get this disease, hypertension. Explain that more than the other issues. And I'm not a politician. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a sociologist. People have the right to feel the way they do. But I don't have a single patient in my medical practice whose blood pressure is not controlled. Not a single patient, men or women. Because they all understand, if I agree to take care of them, they're going to hear the facts. I'm going to explain it to them. And this was published, this study, by the way, in the proceeding of the American Academy of Sciences in 2002. And ever since then, the Joint Commission that supervises hypertension published in 2007 the new ways to treat high blood pressure in this country. But it, it turns out this is the only disease, believe it or not, that has not only a so society of its own, but also has a, a, a committee that supervises it. And yet, people are not listening. I thought it was just only in this country, frankly. But when I read the report from the American, from the European Society of Cardiology last year, it was just as bad as it is here. <laughs> okay? Because people want to make believe they are who they're not. That's their right. But we as physicians have to be truthful. We have 7.7 .7 billion people in the world. 4.4 billion, they about, lives in Asia. They're not Caucasian. 1.5 billion live in Africa. They're not Caucasian. And I'm almost up to 6 billion, right? I'm al almost up to 6 billion. You, you get the point that I'm making? And then you're going to go here and impose your way that you did the research on all Caucasian folks you did the research on. You, when you study anatomy at the medical school, all the, ca ca the people that you, the dead people you're working on were Caucasian. And then you're going to impose that on the majority of the rest of the world? Give me a break. That is why the AMA and all the other powers to be, the American the physician, etc., have now agreed. It has to change. You have to practice patient-oriented, evidence-based medicine. So they've given out grants all over the place. A whole bunch of medical schools have taken the grants already to change the way they teach medical students, all the training program to, train the, to change the way they train and train the resident. That's right, because it's obvious what's going on. I'm not unique. I'm not the only one who knows this stuff. I'm the only one who talk about it because I have to be truthful. Besides, I'm self-employed. They can't fire me for saying something they're upset with. <laughs> they can try all the things they have. They wasted their time. Yes, they wasted their time trying to punish me, to shut me down because I, I'm too truthful and too honest. And they did everything. They ran out of option now. At my age, these folks are still trying to take me out because of jealousy and envy because God gave me the gift of brain power. He gave them gift a whole lot. They have money. They have political power. They have social power. I don't have any of that because that's not who I am. I'm a medical educator and a clinical scientist. And I practice medicine because I want to be independent. That's it. I don't practice medicine to get rich. I practice medicine. By the way, I don't take patients. Don't even bother to call me. I haven't taken new patients in years, and I'm not taking any. Because I'm not doing this show to recruit patients. That's not what this is all about. This is about giving back to this great country that has done for me that which no other country would have done. No other country, no matter what they say, would have done what this country done for me. And I'm grateful for it. And the least I can do is to teach and give back. Okay? That's why, that's what I choose to do. And who to tell me no? Not to do it. So, in any event then, blood pressure therefore is at the center of cardiovascular diseases. And it is sad that the people are blinded by their racial stupidities 
rather than the endangering the, the, the lives. That's right, people are dying. 1.3 million people have hypertension in this country. Some 45% of them are not even going to the doctors to get the blood pressure check. Of the 55 or so that goes, maybe about 28, 30% or so are getting the blood pressure controlled properly. And you can't expect to have a, a healthy life without stroke, kidney failure, heart disease, if your pressure is not well controlled. And the minority community, quote, Negro, African American, whatever you call it, these people are eating five grams of salt per day. An average five gram of salt per day. When the recommended is 2 point to 2.5. When you eat the salt, you're going to retain water. The water is going to expand your cardiovascular system. Your pressure goes up. When you eat a lot of simple carbohydrate, that simple carbohydrate will turn into fat. Complex carbohydrate don't turn into fat. It's only good for satisfying hunger and release you a little energy very slowly. But all simple carbohydrate, which is tons of them, all sodas have simple carbohydrate, all white bread, white rice, bagels, cakes, you just name it. All this stuff has simple carbohydrate. That thing turns into fat. The rest of it gets clogged up into your liver. That is why fatty liver is one of the leading causes of major diseases in the world. In fact, fatty liver, secondary to obesity, is the number one cause of cirrhosis of the liver in the world. It's not alcoholism. It's not the hepatitis. They're bad, but they're not number one. Number one is obesity. How about that? Obesity is the number one disease that causes cirrhosis of the liver in the world. So this is this. 10th half hour show I'm doing on this blood pressure thing. And I'm trying to wrap it up in this segment by giving you an overview. You must accept who you are, what God created you to be, so that physicians don't feel uneasy of telling you the truth. Because listen, I don't have a monopoly to this stuff. My colleagues know this stuff. Believe me, they know this stuff. And I'm not defending them, but they have issues. They don't want to offend the patient. I had a patient in my office years ago. I've been taking care of her for years. And I was so happy for her. She met a guy, she got engaged, and you know, she got married, and they wanted to have a family. I mean, I've been taking care of this young lady forever. She was from Greece. She met this incredibly tall, handsome, Italian guy. And I told her, if you're going, you know, she happened to have, I won't mention her name, but she had, she was carrying beta thalassemia trait. I knew that for years. She knows that. She's from Greece. That's very common over there. And I said to her, you know, you're going to have, you're going to need to see a genetic counselor, but you also should have your now new husband evaluated to make sure he's not carrying an abnormal hemoglobin as well. Well, she said, okay, fine. But the guy then examined the guy, and I did the hemoglobin, all that stuff. And the hemoglobin atrophosis turns out to be positive for beta thalassemia treat as well. How about that? So I thought this guy was going to punch me when I told him that. Sir, you really, I tried to explain to her, you could still have a baby, but there's things you have to do. There's steps that has to be done to see the geneticist to get everything prepared that they, nowadays they're able, in those days, they still can do it, able to actually get blood from the fetus. That's right, they can actually get blood from the fetus while the fetus is in utero to make sure that the fetus is not carrying an abnormal disease. The technology is available. I tried to explain all that. This guy gets so angry, I thought he was gonna break my house. The man get up, oh my God, he said, you tell me you this and that and that, that I'm not as perfect as I thought I was, slam the door and walk out. Never, never to be seen again. So this is why you see my colleagues, they're being very careful. I'm being careful too, but my patients know the deal. If I accept you as a patient, you're going to practice medicine the way I think is the best way, or else find yourself somebody else. 
there are tons of doctors out there. Okay, so I, a patient almost punched me once because I told him his prostate biopsy was positive for prostate cancer, that he's going to need a prostatectomy, and his thing, his biggest thing, was that he won't be able to have his sex life would be affected. I thought the man was going to kill me. I never seen him again. So this is reality. So this is why most of my colleagues are being very careful. Well, they should be, but there are ways of doing this. There are ways of telling the patient so that the patient can get treated properly, so that the pressure can be treated properly. It's the easiest thing to diagnose, the easiest thing to treat, and it's one of the leading causes of stroke, glaucoma, heart disease, kidney failure, all the end organs. We start with the end, the, the brain, the eye, the heart, the kidney, the, all the, the entire arterial system is affected when you have high blood pressure. And it's very common, 1.5 billion across the world. And the medications are available. But remember, all non-Caucasian individuals have low renin, therefore they should never be given an ACE. Number two, no one in their right mind should be treating anyone with a beta blocker as a monotherapy to treat blood pressure. It's n that's inappropriate. Number three, everybody who is hypertensive, has a functioning kidney, must have a Tazi water pill to begin with, and then, then you have to choose which second medication to, to use, a calcium channel blocker, an ab, alpha blocker, all these medications can be used as a second medication, but none, none of these medications should be used by itself as monotherapy without a water pill. It will work transiently, after that it will plateau, the pressure will go right back up again. That's the way I do it. And whenever I say I'm going to do something in medicine, I do it if I say this is the last thing I'm going to do before I die. And I'll be damned if I'm going to do something that is wrong if it is the last thing I'm going to do before I die. Everything I put my hand on something one day, this is my attitude. That's the way I feel. But that's me. Okay? So, again, I'm going to wrap up this segment in the, with the hypertension after 10 shows. You have 10 shows to look at. You could someday find them on YouTube. Someday when I'm gone, there'll be tape, those tapes will be there. So that you could see, I did tell you that, that you got to take care of the basics. If you take care of the basics, which is the diet, the weight management, and so on and so forth, keep the salt down, stay away from too much fast food, do your exercise, blah, 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 you might be able to delay the negative effect of hypertension, which may Maybe you risk your life. Listen, I'm going to stop here until I see you again. This is Dr. Alcina saying so long and bye bye.